Welcome to the second video in this workshop. And as you can see, this video has the number 01 because we start counting at zero, just as a quick reminder. In this video, the pizza problem, we are going to apply all the things and all the building blocks we have seen in the first video to a concrete problem. And here we are going to build a small program that solves an actual problem. Let's have a look at this specific problem. Let's imagine that you want to order a pizza at Sue's Pizza Place. And at Sue's Pizza, there are three types of pizza. It's a small pizza place. There are only three types of pizza, and there's also no choice of toppings. You can get a small pizza, a large pizza, or a party pizza. And these pizzas have different sizes, 26 centimeters, 30 centimeters, and 46 by 33 centimeters. Now, of course, each of these pizzas has a different price point. So the small pizza is 480, the large pizza is 550, and the party pizza is 13 euros. Now, the question you might have now is, well, which pizza is the best value? That's the question we are going to discuss. Now, of course, you could now say, okay, um, the best value pizza is the one that fits my hunger. So maybe you only want a small pizza and that, that's the best value. But for this video, for this problem, we are going to assume that you simply want the most pizza for the smallest amount of money. Or in other terms, you want the pizza that gives you the most pizza for your money. In order to do this, we of course need to understand how large these pizzas are. And this requires a slight bit of high school math. So here we are going to assume that a pizza just has a size. And for a circle, the area of a circle is pi times r squared. And for a rectangle, the area is the width times the length. And this gives us these areas for these pizzas. So to rephrase that, the problem is which pizza offers the best value? And of course, there are a couple of assumptions here. So as I already said, we are going to assume that more pizza is strictly better. Toppings are equal across sizes. So there is there's not a situation in which on a small pizza, you get a different a distribution of toppings, so to speak. And we also have no preference regarding the shape. And of course, this could be something that you care about. Maybe you only want a round pizza. You don't want a rectangular pizza. And of course, there could be other assumptions. And I'll hint towards one or two more later. But for now, you can just briefly stop this video and think about these. Maybe you can come up with more assumptions. The point here is that we are now modeling this real life problem in terms of assumptions and in terms of ways in which we can attack this. Of course, there's more to a pizza than just the size and the price. And of course, some pizzas are not perfectly round, and that's another assumption. So for our model here, we're assuming that round pizzas are perfect circles and that rectangular pizzas are perfect rectangles. And this could be another assumption. So you can kind of add to this list of assumptions here if you want to. But let's just assume that this is what we have, and we're now trying to solve this problem. All right. Before we go into the code, let's briefly talk about solutions. So for every coding problem, or for any problem in general, of course, there are various solutions and approaches that we can take. Now, in programming, we have some common measures for good solutions. And these are, for example, simplicity. So the solution that we are building should be simple, as simple as possible. And we don't want to add more complexity than we need to. Ideally, the solution is reusable. So we want to build a program that does not only work for this particular pizzeria, but we want a solution that works for all types of pizza. We want our solution to be testable. And there is a whole debate in uh, the development world about the importance of testing. But the idea is that we should be able to test our solution to make sure that it actually works. And there's lots of debate about this. And the keyword here is test-driven development. We want our solution to be understandable. So if someone else looks at our solution, if someone else looks at our code, they should be able to understand what is happening. And this is also important if you work in a team, for example. We want our solution to be compliant. And this, of course, depends on the context in which you're doing this. Of course, the pizza solution does not have to comply with anything, probably. But for example, if you are working with an academic environment, you maybe want to comply with certain standards. Or if you're working within a company environment, there might be other um, compliance issues. The solution should be maintainable. That is, we want a solution that 
can be maintained by others and that also can be maintained over longer periods of time. We want our solution to be efficient or that would be a good solution. And ideally the solution is also robust, meaning that it works under various conditions and that it is reliable and that it yeah, just works whenever we need it to work. Of course, these are all kind of standards or these are all measures for good solutions and solutions can be on a spectrum. And not all solutions need to fulfill all of these requirements and some probably shouldn't. So if you're just building something for yourself, a one-off thing, you don't need to think too much about testing and you don't need to think too much about maintainability. So if you're just building a little script that does a thing one time, well, if you are building, let's say, the software for a spaceship, you probably want to think about these requirements for a little bit longer. And of course, that makes sense. But it's important to just keep that in mind. Now, these principles or these ideas can also be linked to principles of good scientific practice. So if we are in, a, in an academic environment, if we are, for example, building code for a research project, then, of course, some of these criteria become important. For example, understandability or... Um, replicability, things like that, because of course these are linked to good scientific practice. Now the solution we are building here for the pizza problem is going to be a solution that is just good enough. So we are not following any standards, with, at least not really, and we are building a solution that, that just works. It's definitely not the best solution, it's definitely not the most elegant solution, and you can go back after the fact and try to make it a little bit more robust, you can try to make it a little bit more, you know, pretty or more efficient. But here we're just going to build a very simple solution that hopefully teaches you one or two things about how to approach not just this particular problem, but coding problems in general, just to keep that in mind. Okay, quickly going back to this problem. Let's think about this for a second. How do we approach this? So the idea would be that we determine the size of pizzas. And remember, we now have this concrete example here, but we want to build a solution that works for all types of pizza problems. And then we need to come up with a value that indicates the quality of our pizza in terms of the price and the area. And then we also need to build some sort of algorithm that determines which of the pizzas is actually the best one and which is the worst one. So the solution for the pizza problem, and I've tried to kind of put this here a little bit more formally, works like this. So first we determine the sizes, prices, and shapes of n pizzas, in this example, three pizzas. Then for each pizza, we need to determine the size. Then for each of the pizzas, we calculate the pizza to euro ratio, which I just called the PTER, just for, for fun. And this is going to be something very simple. This is going to be the area divided by the price so that we get the, the amount of pizza we get per euro. And then we need to determine the best PTER and therefore the best pizza following our definition of best value. All right, let's start coding. Okay, so I've switched over to an empty notebook and you'll find a more complete version of that, but I want to build this alongside me describing or talking about it. And we're going to build this solution now. So the first thing we need to do is, and I'm going to just add a couple of, um, you know, like headlines here, and I'm going to write, write out this notebook as I go. So the first thing we need to do is we want to model these pizzas. And by modeling these pizzas, I mean, we need to find a way of storing and referring to these pizzas. So let's think about how we do this. So the information we need to encode. Now, the, the way we think about this is we now need to store the information about these pizzas. We need to store these pizzas in a way that makes sense to us and that also makes sense to our computer or that we can use in coding. So the building block we're using here is a list more specifically, a list of lists. And we are now thinking in terms of data structures. So we need to find a data structure that holds these pizzas. The way we're going to do this is the following. So we are going to model an individual pizza. For example, here, the pizza small as a list. And that list will have four elements. It will have the type, and that's a string. So here's small. It will have a size, and that is going to be a list. So we already have a list of lists, and the size will have two elements to it. It will have the diameter of the pizza. And if it is a rectangular pizza, it will have also the width and length. And this is going to be a list within that list. Then we will have the price and we also will have the shape. 
Now, if you think about this for a second, you will already realize that the shape is also implicitly encoded in the size. So if we have two values here, so if this is zero, it has to be a circle. And if this is not zero, this would be a rectangular pizza. So yes, shape is implicitly encoded here, but I've added it explicitly here to make things a little bit more easy for us. And also this will allow us to extend our program if we wanted to add additional things after the fact. All right, let's go back to the code and let's try to build this. Okay, so we now let's 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 do exactly what we just did. So the pizza is small and I'm calling this PS. So this list will now be named PS. So PS is a list. And remember we have small for the name. Then we have another list, and this is the size. So here it is 26.0. Then we have the price, which is 480, and then we have the shape, which is a circle. Okay, now let's go on. For the second pizza, which is the pizza large, PL, we do the same thing, and I'm just going to copy paste this here. We have large, we have 30, and we now have 550. That's also a circle. And now let's copy paste this again. And now this is the pizza party. And so this is party. And this is 46 by 33. And this is 13 euros. And instead of circle, this is now rectangular. Now this is nice. If I run this, we now have our lists so we can show them. So we can do, for example, PS and then we see this. However, for processing this, because we now later want to loop over these pizzas, it's not very useful to have these as individual lists. So we want to create a list of lists for all of the pizzas. So let's just modify this a little bit. So let's say we have pizzas, and now we are making a list of lists that contains all of these pizzas. Let's do that. And then we also need to add commas here. And then we also need to close this list of lists. And now we have a more complex data structure here. But what we can do now is, so we can look at the pizzas. So we can look at the pizzas, and then we'll get all of them. And we now can refer to individual pizzas by the index. So the pizza zero would be the small one. And now we have a data structure. This is now a data structure that contains our pizzas. And this data structure, technically, could contain as many pizzas as we want, and it could also contain other pizzas. And from now on, we can just refer to this more generally as pizzas. And if we now want to later look at other pizzas, we would just need to replace them here or add more pizzas here. And we'll have a look at that later. All right, so we've got that done. The next thing we need to do is we need to determine the areas or the sizes for these pizzas, the areas for these pizzas. So let's add a little bit of text here just to um, keep this uh, pretty. So de determining the areas is the next thing we want to do. And let's briefly think about how we want to do this. So we want to have a function that can give us the pizza area for arbitrary pizzas, not just for the ones here. So it won't help if we just do this for the three pizzas here, but we want a general reusable solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a function, and I'm going to now write a comment. Comments you can add to code by using the hash symbol here, pound symbol, depending on how you call this. And everything that's after the symbol is a comment and will not be executed or interpreted by Python. So we can use this to comment our code. So we want a function to calculate pizza areas based on shape and size. Because we have different shapes, we need to have we need to account for these different cases. So a function we do by writing def for define. And let's call this pizza area. And then we have size and shape. So we have two parameters here, size and shape. These are the two things we need. And now we are within that block. 
OK, so now we need to do our calculations. Since we have, at least right now, we have two different shapes of pizza. We have circles and we have rectangulars. We need to account for these two different cases. And we do this by using if constructions. So we say if the shape equals circle, we want to do something. And we also want to do something different if the shape is rectangular, because we need a different type of calculation here. And then ultimately, we want to return the area. That's what we want from this function. So for the circle, we need to go back for this little formula here. So the area is a pi times r squared. And let's do this. So we have this variable called area. And in area, we want to store the area. OK, so now we need pi. And we, of course, could now just type 3.141 to do that. But Python has some constants or many constants already inbuilt. And I'm going to show you how to do this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to import math. And we haven't seen this import statement. Uh, but it's very important with import, we can basically import additional functionality, or we can make additional functionality available to us. So in Python, there is this library called math. And this library, well, it's actually a module, provides us access to math functions and to constants. And we have to explicitly tell Python to give us this functionality, because if we don't do this, we don't have it available. And we basically can load in functionality that we need whenever we need it. And usually, we put this at the top of our script, but I'm just putting it here. So now we have math available to us. And in math, we have constants. So we can now do math.py. And I can prove to you that this actually works. So if we now add another block of code here, and we just do math.py and run this, we will get pi. So now that we have pi, we are going to multiply this with the radius. And to get the radius, remember, we have a list that gives us the size. We just need the first or zeroth element of that list. So we are going to do size 0. And that is just the first or the zeroth. I'm going to call this first, although the index is 0. The first element in that size list here. And then we also now need to divide this by 2 because this is the diameter and we need the radius. So divide it by 2. And let's do this in brackets. And then we need to do this to the power of 2. And if you want to get the power of 2, or if you want to do exponents in Python, you do star star. I'm going to show this to you. So if you do 2 star star 2, this will get you 4. So 2 to the power of 2. If you do 2 star star 4, this will get you 16. So this is how you can do this. And this is just a syntax for, for doing that. So math.py, which we get from our imported module, times the, dia uh, times the radius to the power of 2. Now for the rectangle, it's fairly straightforward. So we do the area. And now we need, we need both of the elements of our size. So we are going to do size 0 times size 1. And then we're going to return the area. All right, let's run this to just have this available. Nothing happened. But Python now knows that this function exists, and we can now use it. So let's try it out. So we can now call our new function, pizza area. And we will put in the arguments here. So there are two arguments. And as you can see, it now already tells us what, what, what it wants. So for size, we need to provide a list. And let's go with the 26 comma zero here and also a shape which is going to be circle let's run this and we get back 530.9 uh 29 and so on and so forth square centimeters what we could now also do is we could now also already round these numbers and maybe that's a good idea because we are not interested in these very precise numbers and we can do this already in this function so before we return area, we can just add round here, so round area, and modify this a little bit. And now if we run it, we will get a rounded number. And let's just run with that. All right. Now that we have that, let's briefly look at looping. 
and at how we can now determine the size for all of our pizzas using our data structure up here. All right, so let's do a little bit more code. And now we are going to do a loop. So for pizza in pizzas, and remember pizzas is those data structure containing our pizzas, we want to do something. So for each pizza here, we want to determine the area. And the area, now using our pizza area function, is, and now it gets interesting. So in this pizza thing here, we get each pizza. So we're taking each pizza out of the box, right? We have four, remember, we have four elements in these lists. So we are taking this list. One, two, three, four. And what we need now is size. So we need this and we need also the shape, which is this back here. So what we are plugging in here now is pizza is pizza one, index one, and pizza, think about this for a second, three, because we need the last element here. So we're plugging this in, and now this will relate to the size, and this will relate to the shape. And now we're going to print this. So we are going to do print, and now we're going to use f strings. So the pizza, and now we want the type or the name of the pizza, and that is pizza zero has an area, has an area off. And now we are going to use the area that we've just calculated. And let's run this. And now we get pizza small has an area of 531, pizza large has an area of 707, and pizza party has an area of 1518. And this is about what I did by hand up here. All right, so we now know that our pizza area calculation works. Okay, next step, PTER, so the pizza to euro ratio. Let's add another headline here. So determining PTERs and the best and worst pizza. This is what we're going to do now. Okay, so Again, for the PTR, we will need a function, or a function is the best way of doing this. So we need a function to calculate the PTER for a given pizza. OK, so again, define pizza PTER. And for that now, we need, of course, the area, and we need the price for that pizza. OK. So again, we start a block here, and this is now very simple. The PTER is going to be the area divided by the price. And then we are going to return the PTER. Okay, this is very straightforward. Let's try this out. So we need to run this. And now run. let's run the pizza PTER for an area of, let's go with the 531 and a price of, what was it? It was 480, 480, let's run this. And this gives us a value. And now, of course, we could also, again, round this and let's do that. And let's round to two here so that we get a um, nice value out of that. Okay, so now we could also do one better. So this works, but we need to plug in these values here. So if we want to go from this structure up here, we first need to do the area, and then we need to calculate the price and do all of that in here. We could also do a modified version of that that's a little bit more complicated. And if you don't feel comfortable with that second option, that little bit more complicated option, you can just run with the first one. I wanted to show this to you. So we can also say um, pizza PTR, that's called pizza PTR2. And instead of plugging in an area and a price here, we're just plugging in a pizza. And if I say we're plugging in a pizza, I mean we are plugging in a list. We're plugging in one of these here, right? Because all the information we need is actually in there. And now we can do the following. Okay, so we, we now have this pizza available to us. 
to, to work with that. So remember what we need. So we first need the area, and we already have a way of determining the area here. So the area, now we're going to do all of that now in one step. So the area is pizza area. We have that available to us. We can actually use that. And we already know how to do this. We are going to do pizza one and pizza three. So now we've calculated the area within our PTR function. And we also need to have the price and that is already available to us. So now we can do PTR equals the area divided by the price. And the price is already in that pizza list. And we know that the price is the, let's have a look at this, zero, one, two. It's the third element of the list and it has the index two. And now we can return the round PTR. So let's save that. And let's also try to work with this. So pizza PTR two. And now instead of plugging in values, we're plugging in a whole pizza. So I'm just going to copy paste one of these here and put this in here. And let's run that. And this works as well. well I rounded it differently here. And now this works. Okay. Now, if you've followed along, we can now also do something like pizza PTER2. And instead of now giving it the actual numbers, we can just refer to our pizza data structure. Remember, this is our pizza data structure. And we've just copy pasted is simply the zeroth element in that list. So we can just do that here. And run this. Oh, I made a mistake here. I should have done regular brackets. And we do that and we get the same result. And now all of this is being done for us. And it's now fairly abstract and it works as intended. Okay. So whether you like this more explicit version up here where we have areas and prices more, or whether you like this version here where we just plug in our data structure and see, we've created this. So all of that this is not inherent to Python. There's hundreds, thousands of ways you could do this. This is just the way we did that. And now we are building our whole program based around this data structure that we came up with, the data structure that we are using. So this function here now uses knowledge about this data structure. It only works because the data structure is the way we have it. And there could be other ways of doing this and feel free to come up with other ways of actually, of actually doing it. And so that is this whole idea of we are building one thing, and then we're building things on top of that. And so this is a thing that's very common when coding, that you're building these structures, and then you're reusing them, and you're modifying them, and you're working with them. And this is why it's so important to do this step here, this modeling step, very carefully, because we are going to rely on this a whole lot. And for some things, there are pre-existing models. For some things, there are pre-existing data structures. And for other things like pizzas, we have to come up with our own because Python obviously doesn't have an inbuilt data type for pizzas. And we just came up with this or we built this, this data type or data structure. All right. Okay. So we are now able to determine areas and we are also able to determining PTRs. And of course, PTRs already contain the area information. So we need the area to do the PTER. Okay, so now what we can do is, and I did the same thing above, we can now calculate the PTRs for all pizzas. So we are going to do a for loop again. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So for pizza in pizzas, we can now return the, or print the PTR. So we're going to print, and I'm going to use the second version here because it's easier. So PTR2, and we're just plugging in the pizza as our argument here. And if we now run this, we will get these numbers. We can also do it a little bit more pretty. So the PTER for pizza is the result of this function. And now if we run this, we get the PTER for, well, now you can see I made a mistake here because now this returns this whole list, but we only want the, the type or the name. So for pizza zero is that. So the 
the PTR for small is that, the PTR for large is that, and the PTR for party is that. And now, of course, we as humans can already see the pattern here. So we can already see that the PTER for the large pizza is actually the best out of the bunch, if we look at that, because it is larger than the others. In other words, you get more pizza per euro. But of course, we want to be able to determine the best and the worst PTR programmatically. And in order to do this, we need to come up with a algorithm. And I'm going to show you a, or we're going to think about a very simple algorithm. It's definitely not the most beautiful way of doing this. And there are easier ways of doing that, but I want to show you the reasoning process here. So we're going to play this through together. So moving away from pizza for a second, imagine that we wanted to find the youngest and the oldest person in the room or in a room. And how would you approach that? Just pause the video for a second and think about this. One, two, three. All right. So let's assume that these are the people in the room and these are their ages. And let's say we know that because we can ask these people. So we can, we can just go through the room and ask, hey, how old are you? And let's also assume that people are honest and give us the actual age. All right. So now one way of doing this is we could just ask random people and then try to just remember um, which is the youngest and which is the oldest person or which is the highest or lowest um, age we've heard so far. But we need a more systematic approach. So let's go with this little algorithm here. So we start by writing down youngest and oldest. And we are now assigning a fairly large number to youngest and a fairly small number to oldest. So 100 for youngest and oldest is, zero, is, is h0. Zero. We just assume that. And now we start at the first person in the room. And we ask that person, OK, how old are you? The person responds, I'm 20. And now we are doing a simple comparison. So we are now comparing 100 to 20, and we are comparing 0 to 20. and if this age, if 20 is smaller than our current youngest, so 20 is smaller than 100, so we are now saying the youngest we've seen is 20. And then we are also asking, okay, for oldest, is the age we've seen larger than the oldest age we've seen, or is it smaller? In that case, it is definitely larger. So we now have 2020. The youngest and the oldest person is, it's, it's the same person as 2020. And we've initialized these two variables with these two numbers because we didn't know what the first person would be. If we already knew the first person, we could just put in 2020 here at the very beginning. But since we assume that we don't know the first value, we just add stand-ins here. And I picked 100 and 0 here as these stand-ins. OK, so now we, we do these comparisons. And I indicated this here. So now we go to the second person and we ask the same question. How old are you? 25. OK. So now we ask ourselves, is 25 smaller than 20? 20? 20s are our current youngest. So we argue, okay, no, it's it's definitely not. And then we also ask ourselves, well, is 25 older than 20? Yes, it is. Okay. So for that step, we now know the youngest person is still 20, and the oldest person is still uh, and the oldest person has changed, so that's now 25. And we would need to keep track which person that actually is. OK, so now we do this. And so we find the next person. Next person, 19 is smaller than 20. OK, 19 is not larger than 25, and so on. Again, 21, it's not a new youngest person. It's also not a new oldest person. 29, OK, still <laughs> the youngest person is still the same, but the oldest person has changed. 18, now the youngest person has changed, but the oldest person hasn't. And now 24, nothing has changed. And now we've went through all the people, and we compared all of these people, all of these ages. And we basically kept track of who is the youngest and who is the oldest person in the room. And now we know that the youngest person is 18 and that the oldest person is 29, very systematically. And this would also work for not just this number of people, but this would work for an infinite number of people. But of course, there is a certain cost to it because we need to make these comparisons. The more people we have, the more comparisons we need to make. And that is a key consideration when thinking about algorithms. How costly are they? And how costly are they if the numbers increase? And 
um, that is a, a key consideration. We are not going into. We we're just assuming that this now works for us. Okay, so now let's implement this little algorithm in Python for our pizza problem. Okay, so we now need to first of all set up these variables that we need. So we need to store the current best pizza, and for now this is empty. It is an empty string because we don't know what it is. And we are also need to store the worst pizza, so the current worst pizza, and that's also an empty string. And then we need to store the best PTR, and that is going to be zero. And again, this is now this initialization, and we need to store the worst PTR, and that is going to be 9999, a high number. And that is exactly the same thing we did in the age example. OK. So now we need to do just these comparisons. So what we're going to do now is, so we're going to loop over the pizzas again. So for pizza in pizzas, we are determining the PTR now. So the PTR, and we already know how to do this. The PTR is pizza PTR2 for that particular pizza. Now, if you don't like the PT, your pizza PTR2 function, you could also have done the following. So we could also use that more uh, explicit function, so pizza PTR. And then instead of plugging in the pizza directly, we could plug in the pizza. Well, we now need, we now actually need the, going back here, we need the area. So we first need to, we need to get the area. In order to get the area, we are going to use our pizza area function. And in that pizza area function, we now need to put in the size. So that would be pizza one. And we also need to put in the shape. So that would be pizza three. And now we can actually uh, do this. So now we can use the area here for our PTR. And we also can use the price information, which is pizza two. And of course, these two things, we already combined this in this P PTR2 function. And that's why I did it in here. Um, but both both would, would work. And I'm going to comment these out. Well, before I do that, I'm going to show you that both of, both of these work. So let's print the PTR for a second here. So this works. This is the more explicit version. And let's comment this version out and run it again. And this works as well. Same results. Let's use the second version because that is a little bit more simple, more straightforward, at least looking at this. Of course, the function here, so the underlying function here, this one here, is more complicated. But within that loop here, it's a little bit more straightforward. So now we have the PTR for that given pizza. And now we need to make these comparisons. So the first comparison we need to make, we're going to use if constructions here. If the PTR we have calculated is larger than the best PTR we've seen so far. And so for now, this is, so we start at zero. So if PTR is larger than the best PTR, so this will be true in any case. We want to save that. So the best PTR now is the PTR we've just seen. And this will make the current pizza the best pizza. So we're going to save, or we're going to store the, not, the name or the type of this pizza as the best pizza, so in here. Right? OK. And now we need to make our second comparison. So if the PTR is smaller than the worst PTR that we've seen, we want to update our worst PTR with our current PTR value. And we want to update the worst pizza, the worst pizza with the name of the current pizza. OK. And these are the same comparisons we did basically um, for, the, for the H. And now, finally, we want to output our results here. So we're going to print the best pizza is, maybe let's do it like that, is best pizza with a PTR of um, best PTR and 
we also want to print the worst pizza. Um, the worst pizza is worst pizza with a PTR of worst PTR. Okay, let's see if this actually works. Let's run this. And I made a mistake. I Oh, I did the wrong brackets here. Needs to look like that. And now we get the best pizza is large with PTR of 128, and the worst pizza is small with a PTR of 110. And this is exactly what we could have seen up here. If, well, for a human, this is easy because we can just see these patterns here. But now our little algorithm did this for us, and it works quite well. Now, of course, for three pizzas, this is ridiculously simple. So, now we can actually try out this whole thing, but for more pizzas. And now we have this little program that can actually do this for us. And we're now going to just change our pizzas up, or we're going to add a pizza up here to do that. So let's say we have another pizza. So let's add one. Let's say we are going to add a family pizza. And that family pizza is also going to be rectangular. And let's say that is 60 by 40. It's a very large pizza. And let's say that is 20, um, 20 euros. Add a comma here. Let's save that. So we used our same data structure here. This is, this is the way we do, we do this. And if we were to consider more things, or if we wanted to have a more complex model of a pizza, this would look more complicated. But let's run with this. So we've added a pizza here. And now we can go back down here and run our program again. And well, nothing has really changed. So that is that is good. But um, if we run this PTR thing up here, we can see that the family pizza is 120. So it's just in the middle there. So let's make this a little bit more extreme. Um, let's add another pizza. So let's add the deal pizza, for example. So deal. And the deal pizza is going to be a, a round pizza, and it's going to be a 32 centimeter pizza, and it's going to be very cheap. It's going to be five euros. It's a deal, and it's a circle circle pizza. Um, going to run this, or and by running I mean I'm going to save save this information. And now of course we assume our deal pizza to be the best pizza. So let's see what happens if we run this again. And now we get the best pizza is the deal pizza with a PTR of 160, and the worst pizza is small with a PTR of 110. And this is now a little program that solves this problem for us. And it solves this problem for us independently of how many pizzas we have and independently of the specific pizzas we are looking at. All right, that works very well. Again, keep in mind, this is a very simplistic solution. And the algorithm we are using here is probably not the best one we could come up with, but it works quite well. And I just wanted to show you how we can think about this and how we can model these types of problems. And of course, you can take the time to think about ways of optimizing, of optimizing this even further. OK, of course, the way we model this pizza, and this is why I talked about these assumptions, is very basic. And of course, you could think about this in more complex terms. And so here are a couple of bonus exercises, or not necessarily exercises, but ways you could think about this. So let's say instead of finding just a pizza with the best PTR, we could think about combinations of pizzas for a given area that's being requested. So let's say you are at a party and you need a specific amount of pizza. And of course, it's still a bit abstract to think in terms of you know, square centimeters, um, you usually wouldn't know I need this and that many square centimeters for my party, but let's assume that this is the case. And then to find the ideal combinations of pizzas uh, for that given area, we could also think of things such as what if we were looking to optimize for as much or as little crust as possible? Of course, this would change how we look at this. So if we're not only interested in just plain area, but also in crust, we would need to look at the circumference, for example. What about if we also take into account another dimension in, in terms of size? So for example, height. So we could compare, um, well, thick, uh, for example, pan-style pizzas with um, thin, let's say, Italian-style pizzas. 
And of course, then there would be other questions in terms of, of what you would prefer, but this could be an option, of course. And we've, we've just not considered that in our model or in our way in how we, in, in, in the way in which we model pizzas. And of course, we could also look at such things as toppings or, I don't know, uh, cheese in the crust, things like that. Bottom line is, when we are building these solutions, we are making assumptions about the problem, and we are often modeling the problem and we're simplifying the problem, and then this will have an impact on how we build our solutions. And also, we need to take into account edge cases, and we need to take into account how we can mitigate differences between reality and, and our models, and we need to be aware of that. And you could you could think about this, and I hope that even such a, well, fun and and and, and uh, semi-serious example such as pizza can already make fairly complicated issues visible and can show you how much thinking you can actually put into that. And in the exercise, we will explore one or two things we could do with that, and we're going to build up on the code that we've just written. So have a look at these exercises, and maybe if you want to think about how we could make this better, play around with this a little bit. Maybe if this was too fast or if you didn't understand things, you can always just play with the code, print things, look at what is happening, and just play with it in order to understand what is going on. Just don't be afraid and have fun. And then we will hear each other again in the next video on regular expressions, files, and modifying text.